Hello. Let me fix my camera here. Happy Thursday, friends. I have to apologize first and foremost for missing last week. Fail on my part. I had the plague. I don't know what it was. It was some kind of plague. And it infested in my sinuses and I was not fit for company and you would not have wanted me to be here. So I apologize that we had to miss it. Um, and I really hate it because I was going to talk about my updated plan for board reviews. And that's what everybody's worried about right now. So I'm kind of kind of bummed. I might try and reschedule that for next week. Um, so anyways, um, today's topic is DIC for the, you know, clinical subject. Should nobody have questions that we want to talk about? Otherwise, I will monologue on my life and none of the secrets that I have in my life and clinical stuff while I get ready for work. If we haven't met yet, I'm Bree. I'm an ICU nurse practitioner. I work in a very busy ICU here in Georgia. And um, I've been doing that for, I'm coming up on six years. Six years in March, I've been a nurse practitioner. Before that, I was a nurse for, we're not even going to disclose how long because you'll know how old I am then. Um, anyways, uh, so feel free. Hey, how are you doing, Scott? Hopefully I set this so that everybody can see the messages now. I may read them out loud because I realized I'm looking back at the last one that I forgot to select that box. And so I thought everyone could see the chats and nobody could. So nurse Scott is here. Hey, Scott. Sorry I missed you last week. Um, Scott and I know each other through nurse Liz. If you don't follow her, you should totally be following her. She's an FNP. You all know her because everybody knows nurse Liz and she does a weekly live stream and has a whole panel that Scott basically moderates and runs for her. Um, and she always talks about really cool, um, controversial topics. I love, I am always in a state of how tired am I after two or three night shifts? And can I form real sentences? To come across as fairly intelligent in order to join that group. <laughs> it's it's a moving target. It's a moving target. Um, so anyways, if we haven't met yet, um, feel free to jump in here. Um, anything, pretty much I'm an open book. Um, it can be clinical related. It can be professional related, whatever. It can be personal related. I have some very cool and exciting things coming up um, in my personal life and my professional life, some of which I may talk about, some of which I may not talk about yet, because you know you don't want to jinx things. Um, but yeah, so really fun times for me. Scott says he's going to miss tomorrow. I'm finally going to meet. Oh, I remember you said that. That's so exciting. So Scott is um, an ER nurse who's in FNP school. Um, so that's really exciting. Is this going to be your first rotation? I think maybe it is, right? You just started school. Um, I remember my very first rotation, I was scared, <laughs> like shaking in my boots when I showed up. Like, I remember it was like a week on a heart failure floor and she was like, okay, go see these three people. And I was like, and do what? <laughs> like, I, I put on my little white coat and pretended to be an NP and walked in the room and basically did a nursing assessment and asked questions I thought related to heart failure. <laughs> oh, it's just terrible. It's terrible. Um, anyways, I'm sure that your pre-shift will be great and you'll have a fabulous rotation. You can come back and tell us all about it. Um, he says, I'm not, I'm scared. I'm a little nervous, but really excited to be in clinical setting again. Yeah, it's fun. It's definitely fun. Um, it's intimidating, but yeah, very inspiring. And it's kind of cool. Like when you do your first NP rotations, because you're finally seeing like the behind the scenes stuff of what NPs do and how they like work in relation with doctors and all that, like weird stuff that you don't really get to see as a nurse. You're like, oh, <laughs> this is interesting. Um, yeah, you learn a whole lot more than just clinical stuff. <laughs> I have a student with me right now and I tell them all the time, I listen, what you hear in this office stays in this office. <laughs> Cause you get all the drama too, you know? Um, okay, so we're gonna be talking about DIC today. Um, so Mr. Midwife requested this topic a couple weeks ago and I know why he requested it. I don't know if he's here today or not yet, but um, you midwives, uh, let me just tell you what, here's what scares me. Okay. I work, like I said, in a very busy ICU. I deal with really high acuity patients with tubes in every hole and drips in every IV and hay and all the things in the throes of death, blood, literally y'all literally last night, I was seeing a patient with a GI bleed and it was blood on the walls. I'm not kidding you. And there are a million people in the room and it was a disaster. I'm cool with that. I'm cool with that. No problems. But when the OB at the hospital comes and sits down in our office and says, hey, I've got a patient for you, I literally start breaking out in hives. I start sweating. I start thinking, oh, dear God, what? Please, please, please. <laughs> like the stress level just goes 
through the roof for me. Um, and it's generally one of two things. It's like um, preeclampsia slash help syndrome or DIC. That's generally what I see. So I know why you're asking that question. I think it probably makes y'all as nervous as it does make us. Um, it's cause once you get to that point, it's bad, like trying to back out of that. It, it's, it's scary. And you have a lot more that you're liable for, right? This is not my typical 80 year old septic patient. This is, <laughs> this is a new mommy, uh, or a still pregnant mommy and a baby. Uh, no pressure, no pressure. This is why I don't do that field. Okay. This is why I leave it to y'all. <laughs> um, fun fact, I had been an MP. I don't know if I shared this before or not. I don't think I have. Um, I had been an MP for all of six weeks, still way in over my head, like scared to death every day. And I'm sitting in my office, like trying to get through my 9 million notes. And the very sweet OB comes in and sits down in my office and she says, okay, <clears throat> so the lady in room, whatever, 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 who's there for um, preeclampsia, like bad preeclampsia. She's like, so what do you think? Should, is it time to take the baby? And I was like, uh, what do you, what do you mean? Take the baby. <laughs> She's like, should I go ahead and deliver the baby? And I was like, I don't know how do we make those decisions. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. You're you're asking an NP of six weeks. <laughs> I have no freaking clue. I was like, am I supposed to know these things? So yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't love your population. I'd prefer y'all stay over there. Um, Preclampsy treatment is delivery. I know, but like, how do you decide? Like, is the baby old enough? Like, how does it? Like, it's just. Whew. Yeah, I don't love it. Maybe you can do a talk for us on preclampsy. I don't love it. Particularly, you know, I'm like the in state. Like preclampsy is like a. It's like a range, right? There's a little bit and there's a whole lot and there's help syndrome and there's DIC. It's like, whew, <laughs> where are they at in that spectrum? Um, so, but you know, what's interesting is that, and I'll get, I'll get to some like organized stuff here just a minute. I know I'm kind of all over the place right now, but um, most all of the help syndrome. Yes. Let me clarify, Nurse Scott. Um, yes. <laughs> elaborate game of chicken. <laughs> yes. So, um, it stands for, uh, it stands for elevate something, um, hepatic enzymes, elevated liver. See, see, tell us, tell us, Mr. Midwife. Um, do I have it written down here? I might, I might. It's, hold on, hold on. Hold please, hold please. Hemolysis. Elevated liver enzymes and low platelet count. Um, basically, what I read about all of the um, OB emergencies, the placenta plays such a strong role in regulating blood flow and the coagulation pathway because you got to get blood in through the placenta to feed the baby and you got to get it flowing through the mommy's body. So there's a very highly sophisticated system of regulating the coagulation pathway within the placenta. So, um, if something messes this up, whether it's preeclampsia, um, whether it, let's see, what are the other OB emergencies, whether it's placental abruption, um, whether it's, um, but I'm, 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 this is not my theory field of expertise, y'all, amniotic fluid embolisms, intrauterine, oh yeah, retained fluid, uh, retained fetal products. I have seen this before. Um, anything that basically breaks that connection and then creates this like overwhelming cascade of um, dysregulated coagulation pathways. You remember that coagulation cascade from school that's like this long? Like it starts with this and it goes this and this and this and this. Like anything can happen anywhere in that spectrum and then everything gets out of whack. So DIC in general, whether it's for an OB patient or someone else, is when this pathway is dysregulated and a patient starts clotting, massive clotting everywhere. And because they're clotting, they're using up all the clotting factors. So then they have a coagulopathy. So the blood is very thin and they can't clot. So they're bleeding. So it's one of these super, super weird things that you see in life and in medicine that is like a constellation of opposites. And they're both fairly catastrophic. <laughs> are they going to die from a blood clot? Or are they, uh, you know, it could be critical limb ischemia. It could be a PE. They clot everywhere. Or are they going to bleed to death? And what do I treat? And how do you decide? It's <laughs> It's the most frustrating of all things, but to back up a little bit and talk about it, DIC is always a secondary problem. It's never a primary problem. It always happens because something else happened to the person. So we talk a little bit about the OB stuff. What I see in my world, septic, septic shock, infection, big, 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 big cause of this, probably the number one cause of this. Um, the infection, so it starts 
So you have this foreign invader in the body, the bacteria starts releasing endotoxins, which messes with that coagulation pathway. And then you also have a secondary effect of, because there's a foreign invader in the body, all of the cells of the body start releasing all of these cytokines, which are the communicators between the cells, because they need to go tell each other, oh my God, there's a foreign invader, let's go fight, let's go fight. So all of these cytokines, interleukins, um, tissue, necrosis factor, all of these things get released in order to communicate and to fight off this foreign invader. But the problem is this can get over ramped up and then you have dysregulation of this coagulation pathway and then chaos, chaos. It is, yes, it is a total mess. Um, other things that can cause it trauma. So any kind of like surgical trauma, like induced surgical trauma, right? Um, endothelial damage because of surgery, um, particularly um, trauma. Um, any accidental trauma, orthopedic trauma, you can have fat emboli, which will, will stimulate that kind of thing too. Um, cancers, you'll see this a lot in cancers, particularly liquid cancers like leukemias. Um, let's see, sir. So pancreatitis, I've seen this in pancreatitis pretty badly too. So pancreatitis, um, I think a lot of people don't realize this when they, you know, first go into the provider role and possibly even at the bedside. I know I struggle with this a little bit at the bedside too, is that pancreatitis, it does not mean infection. Pancreatitis means inflammation of the pancreas. And the pancreas is one of those really bizarre organs that starts eating itself and releasing all of these really, really toxic and caustic um, enzymes. And it's bad for the body, but it doesn't mean infection. It can segue to that if part of the pancreas becomes necrotic. Okay, we're going down a whole pathway. I didn't necessarily intend, but basically my point is um, an, a massive inflammatory response. Burns, um, crush injury, um, pancreatitis, those aren't necessarily infections, but it's it's ramped up that, um, that SIRS systems, that uh, immune system response that tells the body to do all these things, but then at some point something goes haywire and problems occur. Um, the OB emergencies we talked about, that's a big one, um, direct endovascular injury. So this is something I forgot about. So aortic aneurysms, um, cavernous hemangiomas, I've never seen that before, but it can happen, but basically where the endothelium itself in, um, some various area of the, um, venous system where the venous and the arterial systems meet gets damaged. And that in and of itself stimulates this pathway, um, ECMO. ECMO, we see this a fair amount in ECMO. Your um, coagulation pathway is totally messed up. Your platelets get chewed up. Um, <clears throat> you just have massive consumption of your coagulation factors with that. And some people propose that there's sort of an acquired von Willebrand syndrome with ECMO. And um, that, so von Willebrand factor, I think of as the glue. This is the glue in the um, like when you're thinking of blood and how blood is either viscous or coagulating, von Willebrand factor is the glue that starts binding together platelets to make things form a clot. Um, so von Willebrand factor um, inherited problems could do this. And again, people had, um, oh, really fascinating. Uh, Mr. Wife said his wife has had von Willebrand factor. Um, very interesting. Um, not a very common thing. Interesting. Um, I have no idea what surveillance is like for that and people who are not sick. Hmm. Um, interesting. Okay. And then transplant re rejection. So you can have um, um, people who have um, a subset of people when they get a transplanted organ can have a rejection syndrome and it is really bad. I have seen it particularly in what I call liquid, liquid cancers. So hematological cancers, I've seen rejection syndromes. Um, I did a rotation at Winship and I saw it and it's, oh my gosh, it causes so many problems, but it can lead to like downstream DIC pretty bad. <laughs> exactly. Scott says, look at an update. Um, there, one of the friends I work with, <laughs> When I first started, I was like, oh my God, I just have to hit that up to date button on every single patient. She's like, no, no, you don't tell people you're looking up to date. You're consulting Dotty. That's up to Dotty. <laughs> um, yes, in doubt. Always when in doubt, uh, look at some literature and up to date just makes it so easy for you to do so. Friends, if you are new to this field, <laughs> up to date is your friend. It makes it very concise and easy to read. And also, also fun fact, up to date will track your CME. So when you go to renew your license, you can use that, those hours. I got to start putting on makeup. 15 minutes in, I know y'all are like, why haven't you started putting your makeup on, Brie? 
Okay, fun thing I wanted to share with y'all today, my fun part of the day. I have, you know, I'm dry, dry girl. I have terrible rosacea and I'm dry all the time. So I like slowly, like twice, twice a week. And then I put on my favorite face oil. I can't see it without my readers. Seriously, priorities. I know, right? I mean, what are y'all looking at? You are well blessed here right now to see this <laughs> naked face. Okay, it's called Josie Moran 100% Pure Argan. Argon? Argon oil. Oh my God, it's the bomb, y'all. This tiny thing does not last long enough. If anybody knows of a dupe for this that doesn't cost so much, you'll be my bestie. Um, I have tried other types and nothing comes close to this. But after I exfoliate, I put this on and it's like <gasps> heaven. It's like heaven. Um, Scott, did you get your... <laughs> I know I'm going to be late. I know I'm going to be late. They, you know what? They're okay. They're accepting of it. You know, as I say, as long as you are entertaining and happy to be around, people are like, it's okay if you're late. Okay, if you forget things. Now I burp mango. Yeah, but it's not fish oil, right? <laughs> it's it's I'm, it's my favorite way to consume things that I want to consume. I love it. It's great. Okay, 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 okay. All right, okay. Um, so first I use my favorite um, Bobby Brown face base because you know, twelve hour. No, this is actually I'm gonna have to have this makeup on until eight o'clock in the morning. Let me tell y'all, when I signed out this morning at seven thirty, uh, I was a delight to look at. <laughs> It doesn't last that long. So this helps. This stuff helps. Um, true. It's not fishy at all. It has, see? See? Tell Mr. Red Wife. It's not going to make you burpy. It's 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 fine. It tastes good. You get your fish oil in. You can still eat all your cholesterol. I'll be able to go to work and eat my chicken nuggets because that's all they have at 10 p.m. in the hospital. Funny story on the intersection of cosmetics and criminal. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Oh, you guys are entertaining me. I know y'all come here for the makeup. I know you don't come here for my shining personality or the clinical stuff. It is just for the makeup. <laughs> um, okay, so where the hell is my makeup? How am I going to get it on if I can't even find it, y'all? Um, all right. So we talked about the things that cause DIC. It's a lot of things. It's very common things in DIC. Even though it's common, D, um, like, etiologies in the ICU, it's not really a common thing. We just think it's common because when we see it, it's so traumatizing because there's just not a whole lot you can do about it. But I think, you know, recognizing it early that, that you're headed this way is maybe the most important thing of all. Because if you can see that there are already signs headed this way, oh, my gosh, I'm so dry today, y'all. The oil didn't help. It's failing me. Um, then you can start trying to fix the problem because ultimately the fix for DIC is to fix the underlying problem, which is why it's hard, right? The underlying problems are not, these aren't easy problems, except maybe Mr. Windwise problem. You just deliver the baby, right? <laughs> Next time she sits down in my office, I'm going to say, yes, take that baby. Um, I once worked with an ER doc who always put her lipstick before intubation. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> You never know. This might be the last face they see. I love her. <laughs> I love her. She might be my best friend. Um, that is funny. That is funny. When I was in NP school on our lab day and we were um, practicing on mannequins for the first time, it was the same day that we had been down at the Capitol doing like, you know, government NP stuff. And so I had on heels. And so I was intubating a mannequin with heels on. It's like, yes, yes, this is badass, <laughs> even though it's a mannequin. <laughs> uh, all right. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, focusing is not working well for me today. Um, all right, so what were we saying? We were saying about the pathways that it's, yeah, fixing the only problem. So, yes, so the pathway is all your clotting factors are eaten up. You're clotting all over, and the clots can be anywhere, arterial, venous, and then you have no platelets. You have no other factors, um, and it's multiple different types of factors, and so uh, you bleed. And a lot of times, clinically, what I see in the real world is that this is how you first notice it. I mean, your patient is probably in shock. Like, this is a sick patient, right? They're, they're, they are not doing so well, and they may be on pressors. And so you already know you have issues, but your nurse may come to you and say, my line won't stop bleeding or um, they're just bleeding out from somewhere. And it's not like 
massive GI bleeding level bleeding. Like it's not, Oh God, this is rough today. Um, but it's enough that you're like, mm, this is more than oozing. This is a lot of bleeding in a patient who's very, very sick. And I haven't been able to turn it around. That's your first clue. You got DIC. So, um, they start weeping from everywhere. Exactly. Exactly. She does everything the male docs do and she does it in heels. Exactly. That's right. That's right. Um, I don't, I mean, I don't know how much experience y'all have had with like female intensivists, but like, and I'm not intensivist, you know, I'm an MP, but I feel like women who are drawn to um, ICU doctor jobs have a definite certain personality type because um, they like to be leaders, you know, um, and they are definitely strong personalities. <laughs> I try and be the balancing force for that. Although the doctor I'm working with tonight would say, uh, no, Brianna, there is nothing docile and passive about you. That's probably true. But at least I'm pleasant about it. I'm not, I'm not mean. And I definitely like when I go into like code status mode and things are bad in the room, I am not a yeller. I'm not going to just start like yelling at people. Um, I just don't find that helpful at all even though every code I go to is chaotic and it embarrasses me because my gosh, the codes that are run in the OR are like, like just orchestra, just beautiful, all in synchrony. And I wish we could do that, but that's not the reality of how codes work um, in a non-controlled environment. Um, but anyways, but yelling doesn't help, which doesn't help. I do get frustrated though when people don't give closed loop communication, like, cause you can be like at the head of the bed, like doing something, you're like, can somebody get me whatever? And nobody says anything. And so then you find yourself saying it three times. Um, you caught DIC once the patient's gums were bleeding. Yeah. That's pretty like subtle start. Right. But yeah, that's a, a very common place. Yep. Um, and you're like, Oh, crap. <laughs> um, all right. So back to the pathway a little bit. Um, so you have all the cytokine activity, the fibrin accumulation is high. So your fibrinogen levels in your bloodstream will be low. Um, you'll have lots of small endovascular clots which can lead to tissue ischemia, including limbs, including all the organs of the body, thus multi-system organ failure from the DIC itself, or maybe from whatever was causing the DIC. Who knows? It just aggravates everything. <laughs> everything starts to die. Um, so um, then you have the coagulop, then you have the fibrin accumulation, clot accumulation, low platelets because of the consumption and the coagulopathy of bleeding. Um, so this is a clinical diagnosis, really and truly, you have to have the underlying problem. You have to have the suspicion like bleeding gums or bleeding somewhere, most likely bleeding. It starts with clotting, but typically you don't realize that first. The first clinical thing you tend to see is the bleeding. So that's why I say that, but the clotting does come first. Um, you have, so the clinical scenario to support it, um, exam or something happening that makes you suspicious of it. And then you start drawing your labs. I personally like to diagnose this on a TEG, but I don't always teach it that way because not all organizations have access to a TEG. If you don't know what a TEG is, it is a thromboelastogram and it is divine. Uh, most trauma services and ORs use them. Um, it is designed for someone who has a severe coagulopathy that is probably bleeding because they have a lack of factors and things need to be replaced. Um, so people who are massively bleeding, I love it in GI bleeds for my specialty. I love it for DIC. I like it for anybody who's like bleeding a lot. Um, anyways, so a tag is one way to go. And I'll talk in more detail about that in just a little bit, but the standard way that most people are going to do it in hospitals is they're going to get a fibrinogen level platelet level. Um, you can, I think most places will allow you to do something called an FDP, which is a fibrinogen, fibrin, fibrinogen degradation products. Say that three times fast. That's hard. Um, those will be high. So your fibrinogen level will be low because your body's using up all this fibrin to form these clots. So your fibrinogen will be low. Your platelets will be low. Your FDPs will be high. Um, they may or may not have a reduction in H and H. I think a lot of people think, okay, well, they're not anemic or they're not dropping their hemoglobin. That doesn't mean they're not in DIC. It just means that they're not losing enough blood that you're seeing it in the labs yet. Um, so that's where you start. Um, you can also check uh, D dimer level. Um, I have some thoughts about uh, D dimer. 
I don't have a love affair with D-dimers because a D-dimer really just tells you that there is inflammation somewhere in the body. And my God, what in the world, in the hospital doesn't create inflammation. So, you know, I mean, I think more than anything, a D-dimer level excludes things. So if you, it has more um, negative predictive value than positive predictive value. Same thing with PEs. Like every hospitalist I know wants to order a D-dimer on someone that they think maybe has a PE. And I'm like, why? I mean, it's not going to be negative. It's negative. It's never negative. <laughs> I've heard you can call the heart and raise your D-dimer. That's probably true. <laughs> That's probably true. Anything can raise your D-dimer. Anything. One time, fun fact, one time, um, <laughs> one time. <laughs> so my youngest kid is six years younger than my middle kid. Uh, there were a lot of years in between there because for a while I was like, I cannot have any more children. And my husband was like, no, no, we need to have more kids. And I was like, no, no, we can't have any more. I cannot do this again. It took me, it took him a while to get me on board. I was not convinced. And there was this one time that, um, this is how I know God speaks to me, right? I, I was having unilateral calf pain for no reason. I was an ER nurse at the time. Uh, just unilateral calf pain. Like who has unilateral calf pain except somebody who has a DVT. But being a classic nurse, I was like, well, I'm just going to ignore this. It's going to ignore it, right? I mean, why would I do anything about it? So, but I knew it was there and it was in the back of my mind and giving me anxiety, but I wasn't going to do anything about it. So I um, am laying in bed at home. My husband traveled to work at the time and my kids were at my um, in-law's house. So I was by myself the night before work and I'm laying in bed and all of a sudden, all of a sudden I feel this like little, I don't know if I call it like a, um, almost like a muscle contraction in the, the calf where I was having the unilateral pain. And then I couldn't breathe. So it was like this. And then all of a sudden I woke up from sleep and I was going, <gasps> and I was like, I've thrown a pee. I've thrown a pee. <laughs> Convinced myself I'd thrown a pee. Got out of bed, chewed an aspirin, forgot to put a bra on, but chewed up an aspirin, went outside, sat on my porch and locked the door because I thought, well, when the paramedics show up, I don't want to be locked inside the house if I die. So <laughs> I'm sitting on the porch, chewing my aspirin with no bra. <laughs> paramedics show up. They put me in an ambulance and take me to the hospital. And I had convinced myself I'd thrown a pee, convinced myself of it. Okay, so they do all the workup. Starts with the D-dimer. Sure as shit, my D-dimer was elevated. And I was like, oh my God, I've thrown a PE. Go through the whole CTA, there's nothing there. I had not one, but two venous duplexes because I was like, there's a clot. I'm sure there's a clot there. Nothing was there. It was a freaking anxiety attack, y'all. So anxiety attacks can give you a D-dimer elevation, okay? You can work yourself up into a D-dimer. So yeah, cough could certainly do it. Um, the end result of all that was that I was 33 years old at the time. I was like, well, I mean, death is imminent. So if we're going to have another kid, we might as well. And that is the story of how we got pregnant with my third kid. <laughs> uh, emergency face, first aid for suspected PE. She won't ask for it. Exactly. Don't forget the bra. Okay. Again, appearances matter. You're not going to have time for makeup. At least put the bra on. <laughs> See the things that you guys don't have to think about or worry about. My gosh, you guys luck out. Um, so yeah, D dimers don't mean much to me. But yes, in this case, you could get a D dimer. It would be elevated. Um, if it weren't elevated, I don't know that that means anything either. But whatever, you can get it. That's what the textbooks say. So that's what I'll tell you to do. Um, you can get a PTI and R. Um, and that kind of segues into the tag. Was there any other labs that I was supposed to talk about? Let me just make sure. Keep myself on task here. No. <clears throat> so on a tag, I don't know if y'all have ever looked at a tag before. A tag is a visual representation of how a clot forms. So it is going to give you a graphic. It is going to, I'm gay. I do hair and makeup. Before <laughs> well, especially for firefighters and paramedics. I mean, you need to have your best foot forward when they show up. Uh, yeah, I get it. I get it. Um, okay. So, all right. So yeah, tag. So tag is a visual representation of how a clot forms and it, it's going to spit you out several different numerical values. It's looking at the time for a clot to form. Um, so the time it starts, wait, the time it takes to start forming a clot, which is a long skinny line, then you will start to form a clot and you'll see these, this one line separate into two lines. And this is going to tell you the, um, 
um, the time at which clot formation starts developing. So the speed it takes to start, like how long it takes to start, which can be delayed, how long it takes to start forming the clot. So you're looking at the angle of how the lines separate. Then you're looking at how um, wide the angle gets and it will start to look like a wine glass. So it'll come out and look wide. And this is going to tell you the, the, the difference between these two lines, the radius, diameter, diameter, um, that's going to tell you your clot strength, like how strong is this clot. And then um, eventually it'll tell you how long it takes for the clot to start degrading. So fibrinolysis. So all the factors of how a clot is formed from like time to um, strength of, um, I'm not saying this very well today, but all the factors around how a clot is formed. And I like it because I'm a very visual person. So normal is going to look like a typical like white wine glass. When you start looking like a red wine glass with a short stem, you have a very um, short R time. And this is a problem. This means you're clotting too soon. If your wine glass gets super long and your stem is long and you were thinking, if I pick that wine glass up, it would probably topple over on the table, then you have a problem with um, not developing clots soon enough. And that is an issue with not having enough FFP. You need FFP to shorten that segment. That's your R time. Um, then you look at, um, again, the speed and the strength of clot formation. And th these are the factors that you're gonna look at for DIC. So something called the MA, the maximum amplitude in, um, in DIC is going to be low. So it'll be less than 60. So your, your white wine glass is gonna start to look like a champagne flute. It may have a long stem. It's gonna be very skinny and narrow. Um, if it looks like a champagne flute, you're in trouble. Um, this means it's taking a very long time for a clot to form and it's not getting very strong. So you ain't forming clots, so you're going to bleed. Um, so anyways, that's your MA. The other value that looks at clot strength is the K. Um, and the K time would be greater than two minutes. Um, okay. And then there's one other thing you can calculate, and that is an ISTH score. And I forgot what the name of that thing. is It's something international something, something, something. And it, it plugs in numbers like different labs and um, clinical factors to tell you uh, how likely it is that this person is in DIC. I have never calculated one of these, but it's probably a very nice, like objective way to assess this, you know, um, because again, this is a clinical diagnosis. There's no one thing that you can like draw a lab and say, yep, positive for DIC. It's, it's a whole big picture thing. Um, <clears throat> so you know your patient's sick for whatever reason, they're not doing well because of the sickness, and now they've developed DIC. This is a sign of impending doom. It is bad. Um, the nurses know it, everybody knows it. It's just, it's bad, it's badness. Um, it basically means that whatever the initial insult was has been become a runaway problem. And if you don't help them turn a corner fast, they are going to die. I think the mortality for people once they get to DIC is really, really high. I read it. I love all the wine glasses. Yes. Red champagne martini. Now martini would be very interesting looking. I don't know if I've ever seen one like that, but they would probably be way too clotty. They would probably need some like, um, fibrinolinics. Interesting. Um, okay. So what I say under treatment, I need, hold on, hold on. Let me take just another minute. Um, blend this stuff out and then get some blush on it. We can move on. We'll get to the hard part, which is the eyes. The eyes are always hard. Very complex. Um, treatment is what I hate about DIC. It's so frustrating because there's just there's just not much you can do except replace the factors. Um, hope they don't bleed. Hope they don't clot anything off and try and fix the underlying problem, uh, which nine times out of 10, if you're at that point, you've been trying to fix the problem. They just ain't getting better. Um, I have only ever seen a mommy die one time and I'm trying to remember the scenario. She was young. She had, she, okay. She had delivered the baby and then she bled, she bled and bled and bled. And I don't remember if she had some type of inherited syndrome. There was something there, but oh my God. Oh my God. Anyways, we won't talk about how sad it is. It's traumatizing. Um, cause I can handle my septic grandpa. I can handle my pancreatitis. Who's been drinking alcohol for a hundred years and you know, sorry, I can handle that. Mommies, come on now. Come on now. 
Okay. We talked about factor repletion. Oh, I kind of already talked about this. So using your tag as a guideline. Long R time, you may have an elevated INR. You may have an elevated APTT. Basically, you're going to get FFP. And this is what I see most commonly deranged, not necessarily in DIC, but in everything else. Usually, the problem is people have a long R time. Give FFP. Um, the nice thing about this is, okay, just tags in general, is that when you have a bleeding person, you give blood, you give blood, you give blood. What we really should be doing is giving whole blood and not packed red blood cells because they need all of the other factors that are included in the blood. They need the platelets. They need the plasma. They need the cryo. They need all of the factors to help um, give them the product back as well as the coagulating factors back. So tags allow you to really pen prick exactly, pen prick? Select? <laughs> exactly what products need to be replaced. Um, it actually doesn't tell you anything about blood. That's kind of a misconception. I, I don't, I, I judge how much blood I need to give someone, not even on a hemoglobin level. I base it on how much they're bleeding because hemoglobin levels lag. I find that bedside nurses universally pinpoint. That's the one. <laughs> Pin prick. Yes. Words are hard. Words are hard. Um, like universally nurses don't realize this. Like I can go into a room of someone with a, yeah, six hour lag. Okay. I love it. I love it. Very objective. You go in a room and a patient is vomiting bright red blood and there's a basin that's like, you know, a fourth of an inch full of bright red blood and the blood pressure is maybe a little soft, maybe like a hundred systolic. They're a little bit tachycardic and they look kind of rough. And the nurse is like, well, you know, what should we do? We, we, his hemoglobin's normal. We drew it two hours ago. I'm like, I don't care if you drew it right now. It doesn't matter. He's acutely bleeding. This is an acute bleed. Your labs are not going to reflect that. Treat the patient, not the labs, y'all. Why Why don't we know these things? Why don't we know these things? Low BAP is a late sign of tap. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. It all comes back to looking at your patient. If they don't look well, something is not well. Something is not well. Okay, I want to go back a minute because Mr. Midwife said he's only lost two to three moms, which is great because you've been practicing for a long time, right? But yes. Very, very devastating. Um, those are not people who are supposed to die. They're not. They're not. Um, for me as well. Um, <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> All right. What am I doing? I think tonight is going to be browns. I'm thinking browns. Film the browns. Because last night was GI bleed last night. I guess that's why I'm talking so much about GI bleeds. Because we had some, we had some bleeders last night. It's like everything comes in waves in the hospital, right? Nothing but COVID. And you have nothing but alcohol withdrawal. You have nothing but PEs. You have nothing. It's all GI bleeds right now. Our poor gastroenterologist had to get up multiple times last night and come in and scope people. I felt bad for her. But I was grateful that she did. Very grateful that she did. Because um, there's only so much you can do. There's only so much blood you can give back to someone. Are you doing a smoky eye for night? I don't know. Smoky to me means more like charcoaly, blackish. I think I'm going to go with browns. I'm feeling very brown. Um, probably not the color of my melanotic stool patient last night. <laughs> so not, not coffee ground brown, but maybe regular poop brown. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> Everybody else who's on here is like, what the hell? What is this show about? What is this show about? Does anyone else have questions they would like answered? Um... This is the Scott and Chad show, and I love it. I'm here for it. Uh, yeah, brown. Okay. Yeah, this one. This one. Okay. So we were talking about products. Yeah. So low platelets or low MA um, on your – well, we already talked about this. This is the, the main thing that you're going to see on DIC. Your platelet count's going to be low. If your platelet counts aren't low, you don't have DIC. You just don't. Um, fibrinogen will be low. but So anyways, platelets will be low. Your MA will be low. Those two kind of – correlate with each other. So if you don't have a tag, that's kind of what you're looking for. But a tag is just more specific. Um, you're going to give platelets back for that. That's the solution for that. Give them platelets, even though there's a blood shortage. And every time you order it, Epic wants to give you an alert. Are you sure you want to order it? There's a massive shortage. And I'm like, uh, yeah, they're bleeding to death. They need it. New lipstick color for HCPs melanin, right? <laughs> I'm not so sure it would go over well. Code brown. <laughs> Uh, I'm so glad you guys are here. <laughs> this is great. Um, quality content. Quality. What color should go in the middle? I think this one. Um, 
All right. And then long K time will correlate with your fibrinogen level and your alpha angle. And for that, you're going to have cryo precipitate. You're going to give usually like one or two cryos. And if your blood counts are low, you check that with an H&H &H and you replace that. But you're not going to see that on the TEG. The TEG is looking at coagulation, not anemia. I don't think I fully understand that for a little while. <laughs> you know, some of those aha moments you have when you're working and like you've been working for a minute and it's like embarrassing. She's like, I've been doing this for two years and I don't think I ever knew that. <laughs> I still have those. Still have those. Epic. <laughs> Um, yeah, Epic is great. I love Epic. I mean, we had, what did we have before McKesson? And it was, um, freaking, uh, there are multiple different builds of McKesson. It was the worst one. I can't even remember the name of it was now. We used to call it a bad name because it was so, so bad. So, so bad. It happens all the time. You say, how did I not know this all the time? Exactly. I love having those moments. I, y'all still to this day, I have been a nurse since 2000. I still have moments where I'm like, Holy crap. That makes total sense. Now I get it 20 years later. <laughs> it only took 20 years. Better late than ever. Um, okay, so yeah, smoky brown. Yeah, I guess this is kind of a smoky color. I mean, I suppose so. So I have been um I have not, so I've been working on my blog a little bit, but I haven't been doing as much of my YouTube content lately because I have been like all in trying to finish writing a book. I have one book, um, it's called The Ultimate HMP Cheat Sheet. And it's like, I mean, speaking of epic and trying to write notes, like um, it took me four months as a new NP before I started going home on time because I was so inefficient with notes. There's smoke in your eye, kid, I love it. Um, was so inefficient with my notes that, um, every time I got a new patient, I'd have to look something up on up to Daughty. I'd have to figure out what I was doing about it. And then I'd have to figure out what I wanted to write in the note and I'd forget. So then the next time I didn't remember what I needed to do. So once I learned that you could make dot phrases that like, you know, they're basically like pre-populated, um, bodies of text that you save to like pull into your note. You can even do like entire notes that way. And then when you get that patient, you just hit dot whatever, like I have dot GI bleed and that problem list is already written. So all I have to do is edit like the specific things for that patient. Like, no, this patient's hemoglobin is actually this and the GI doctor has not come in yet, you know? So I can be done with that problem in like, you know, less than a minute. So I can get a note done. If I know what the problem is for the patient, really fast. And so that's when I started like going home from work on time before that I would work. I mean, we do seven to seven. I would be at work until 11 o'clock at night, finish writing notes. And it was so stressful. So anyways, so once I discovered that I started building this like huge library of dot phrases and it like changed my world. And I was like, why didn't, why don't we know about these? So anyways, I had a student one time and she was like, you really, can I have a copy of these um, which I didn't know how to do. So I ended up writing them all out like at home. And I was like, why I should make a book out of this. Then I made a book. Then I started selling the book. It's been really great. So it's been really popular. Um, it's kind of the book that I would have wanted, obviously I'm ICU. So it's ICU focused problems, but it's like, you know, an H and P, um, list of like the most 12 common ICU problems. And, um, it's been so popular. I've, I think I'm like at 450 books I've sold so far. So it only had 12 problems. So I thought, let me, I'll write another one. So I've been in the throes of book writing for the past two months and it can get a little bit obsessive. Um, and I'm like 90% done with it. And I just want to be done. So that has been eating at my life, but it is about done. So that is, that is a very exciting thing for me because I'm so ready to be done with it. Note writing is hard. It was the hardest. It, it was. I always thought that the hardest transitioning thing for me as a new MP would be learning how to talk to nurses and not feeling like intimidated because like, what if they ask me something I don't know and I'm gonna look stupid and they're not gonna like think highly of me and then they're not gonna want to do what I ask them to do and like they're gonna know I'm an imposter. It wasn't. It wasn't at all. It was the freaking note writing. 
because I only had um, six weeks of orientation and then I was expected to see eight to nine patients a day. And I was like, oh my God, so overwhelmed. Um, but top phrases changed, changed my life. So when I have students with me, I have one right now. I'm like, look, this, we, I harp on it so, so much because it's how you start like saving your work and you learn the right way. You build your, your library of dot phrases the right way. And it takes a while. It's, it's hard at first, but then, um, you become like the most efficient person and writing notes is how I work through a problem. This is how I figure out what's wrong with a patient. I mean, I can stand in a room and figure it out, but until I like start looking at the labs and like putting it all together, to me, it's like a mystery. It's a medical mystery. Um, and I do that when I'm writing. <sighs> okay. You should see other guys. <laughs> the left eye is darker. Oh, dang it. Is it? It is darker. Thank you. See, this is why I have y'all. Thank you. I did say, please let me know when things don't look right. Cause then I'm going to be walking around work. The good thing is it's at night and the lights are all off. They turn the lights completely off at night, but you are absolutely right. It is way darker. What the heck? Did I like completely miss it? <laughs> What happened there? Um, which color was I using? I think it was, oh Lord, <laughs> this could be interesting. <laughs> We're helping me with her makeup and learning at Fine Arts. Hi, oh my gosh, nurse Liz's people here. I just found this channel. Hello, welcome. <laughs> welcome to the, um, today is the poop show. Literally, we've been talking about poop. <laughs> and my eye color of choice has been reflective of that. So we've been discussing that, um, we should have like a healthcare palette um, with different shades of code brown, <laughs> which is like one of the main reasons I wanted. Well, I won't say it's one of the main reasons I wanted to leave the bedside, but man, let me just tell you what, it is a nice thing now. That GI bleed where I was at last night and the room was so, oh God, you guys know there's nothing worse than the smell of a GI bleed. I was like, um, I'm going to just leave now. <laughs> it's lovely to be able to walk away. Yeah, it's, you know, it's not working out so nice. So KM, hey, welcome. This is uh, a get ready with me kind of thing. Somebody asked me um, a couple months ago to do a makeup tutorial and they had totally validated my existence. So I decided, um, I mean, I'm not gonna be able to do like a makeup tutorial, but uh, you can watch me get ready while I work and we could talk about clinical stuff or whatever y'all want to talk about. So I've been picking a topic of the week each week and this week we were talking about the IC. So I do save these live streams. You can go back and watch it from the beginning if you're interested in DIC. Last week we talked about liver. No, it wasn't last week. Last week I was sick. Um, but the week before that we talked about liver failure and it was, whew, it was a rough topic. I'm not entirely sure. Next week might be a pickup. I mean, I, I try and tie in the topic to what my blog post is for the week. So I have all my content together. But um, I don't know. Last week I missed talking about board review. And I really kind of want to talk about it because so many people want to talk about how to study for boards because everybody just graduated in December and everybody's freaking out. Um, I remember that place too. And I have some really, really great ideas on how to study for boards. I mean, not only from how I did it, but um, I had a student last year um, and she gave the best advice for what to do that I wish I had known. Um, so I'm, I may go off blog topic next week. I'm not sure next week is I'm trying to do like one week clinical and one week professional topics. And so next week I'm not next week might be um, timing of when to start applying for MP jobs, because I think there's a lot of misconceptions out there that people have about when they should be applying. And I have strong opinions on that. I mean, I have strong opinions on most things in life. So welcome. <laughs> Christine, I'm in nursing school still. I should totally update the creepy incognito account. Yeah, I, welcome. You can go by whatever you want to go by here. We are all inclusive. Um, you can go by KM if you'd like to, but welcome. Um, in nursing school, okay, what kind of nurse do you want to be? Practice tests, heck yeah. Practice tests are, um, so I used Mometrics Test Bank. I, I did a lot of the DRGs, DRTs, DRTs from um, Barclay, because I did the Barclay review, but I like those Mometrics books, and there's a lot of different companies who do them, but um, Mometrics reached out to me, like after I made that video a couple of years ago about how I study for boards, and um, I mean, I think they kind of wanted me to like hawk their stuff, it just never really worked out, but I do, yes, uh, that's how I learned too, just doing it. 
But my student, I mean, not to give away what we'll talk about next week, but my student was like, I mean, I did question after question after question. However, um, she was like, you really should on top of that be scheduling once a week, like a practice um, test scenario where you set an alarm, you have, how long is your test? Four hours. And you take 175 questions with one break with one piece of paper for a brain dump and you literally mimic taking the test. And I'm like, Oh my God, that's genius. I mean, for those of us who have severe test anxiety and next week, Oh yeah, I'm totally doing test stuff next week because I've got to tell y'all my test experience because it is the most entertaining. It'll be the most entertaining 10 minutes of your life. And if, if your story can beat my test story, you will get like, 10,000 bonus points in life or something, because I don't think anybody's story can beat mine. It is absolutely hysterical and tragic at the same time. Um, she wants to be the kind of nurse who gets paid. Well, she won't have any problems with that because holy crap, um, nurses are making pretty much more than I am these days. Um, you can do whatever you want to do. You can go into whatever specialty you want to go into. You can walk in the door. It's a good time to go to nursing school and don't let people on all the forums tell you that nursing will burn you out. Nursing is the worst. Nursing is a great profession. I mean, you, if you get burned out, you just do something else. I change jobs every two years, every two years. Um, <clears throat> Y'all, did you see this headline today? I need to read about it. Okay. I'm not gonna be able to speak educated about it because I haven't read about it, but I, heard, I saw somebody talking about it actually on TikTok. Um, that there were some nurses from Florida who weren't actually nurses that were working as nurses during the pandemic and somehow got licensed, like fake licenses. Does anybody know anything about this? What the, what the what? What the what? It doesn't surprise me. I will say there were some RNs on our unit, those fake schools. What? So like this school, like people would just pay the school and the school would give them a degree. How did they get bored? How did they get, how did they get um, a license? How did they take past boards. Well, that's a whole different topic. Uh, you know, you and I are on the same boat on that. <laughs> uh, diploma mills for NPs in particular, I guess there are some for RNs too. I've been out of that game for a little bit, but uh, for, for NPs is just, I, this is why I choose to teach on my own forum and not through the educational system. Cause I am very jaded towards our educational system for NPs. It is Okay. I, I probably shouldn't say too much publicly. <laughs> People will come after me. Um, I like to be able to control my own narrative. This should not be for profit. Nothing that we should, we tell future nurses and NPs should be for profit. We should not tell them false things about what they can do, should do, or capable of doing because it will earn me a hundred thousand dollars in tuition. Oh God. If only I could go back. If only I could go back and know what I know now. I would probably still choose the, the school that I chose. I still stand behind Emory. I think they're a great school, but um, they're a business like everybody else. Um, NCLEX review. Florida also has the lowest NCLEX pass rate overall. Well, apparently they got like, like 7,000 nurses that are being brought up and there were more that they found that had this fake degree. Uh, still the sinus. I am coming off the heels of a gnarly sinus infection and there's stuff. It just, there's just stuff. I apologize. Um, okay. Did we, okay, some, am I done? Is it even enough? Even enough? I think it's even enough. Um, let me just make sure before I go. Oh, I forgot to talk about snake bites. Snake bites. I've seen DIC with snake bites and cancer. I've seen it with cancer too. Transfusion reactions can do it too. Trolley, I forgot about that. So anyways, on the last part of my blog, I talk about how to correct it. It's, it's all just fixing the underlying, like you give products and you fix the underlying problem, like OB, deliver the baby, remove the placenta, remove the retained fetal products, mitigate preeclampsia, ECMO, stop the ECMO. <laughs> Surge sepsis, find the source, treat the source. <laughs> trauma, stop the trauma, stop the bleed. <laughs> like it's, so it's not complicated. It's just complicated because you may not be able to do it. Um, so I did want to wrap that up and say that, yes, there is what, here's what you do about it. You recognize it early, try and fix the underlying problem and give them products back and pray, pray, have realistic conversations with your, uh, families. So that wraps up DIC. I hope that was helpful. Um, yeah, these nurses, I'm gonna have to read about this tonight because I just can't, I mean, 
part of me is like absolutely astounded by it. And part of me is not shocked at all because y'all, I worked in a COVID hotspot. I can't say the name of the place where I work, obviously, but worked in a COVID hotspot. I mean, when I say a hotspot, we opened up an entire unit of 30 three beds that were not an actual ICU, but it was the best we could do of vented patients, 33. And then, and that's just that level of COVID. Then, then on top of that, all of the like non ICU level COVID, we opened a mobile unit outside the building that was, we called it the trailer, but it wasn't a trailer. It was a very nice mobile unit that housed 20 something patients. We were at one point in time boarding people across the street in the psychiatric facilities gymnasium. We had more COVID than we knew what to do with. It was legitimate hotspot crisis. So we had more travel nurses than I've ever seen in my life. And I was a travel nurse for four years, long before COVID. So I got nothing against travel nurses, nothing at all. I am all for it. And I don't like when people are biased against them because people are. But let me just tell you, some of the nurses we got in there, I mean, we joked, we we're like, are they actually a nurse? But many of them had been a nurse for a very brief period of time. And then we're coming into an ICU of very, very, very sick patients and basic things that you would communicate to them that even a non-ICU nurse should know. You were like, wait, wait, what? Wait, what? Like one of my coworkers tells a story of asking a nurse to bring her um, an ABG. Can you bring me the ABG results? And the nurse printed out and brought a copy of the CBC. Wait, what? She also told me a story of a time that chaos was happening. And she asked a nurse multiple times. She went to the head of the bed to start intubating. She asked a nurse multiple times to start CPR. Multiple times. And she thought, maybe he just didn't hear me because there's a, there's a little bit of a translation issue. Okay. Then maybe he's in a state of shock. No, she actually mimicked doing compressions on the chest. Looked at her with a blank face. Like, oh. I don't understand. Sounds the same, right? It's, it's blood. It's blood. <laughs> no. um, so, yeah. Um, maybe it doesn't surprise me so much that there were people who weren't imposter RNs out there working, uh, trying to get all that money. You know, money will do things to people. It was a bad time. I'm so glad we're not there anymore. Um, it's scary. It's super scary um, that people would be that selfish that they would put other people's lives in danger. And yeah, I mean, there were certainly people working in the ICU that shouldn't have been in the ICU. But, you know, not being a nurse at all is a whole nother level of holy cow. How does this happen? How does this happen? I could tell you other things, but I probably shouldn't because some of it gets a little bit like hospital specific and generally I don't lose my job. Um, all right. So I'm going to wrap this up. We're at 57 minutes. I'm kind of narrowing this down to about an hour every time. This is going to be a lot of noise, but my gosh, the shedding. Um, anybody have any last minute questions or things they want to bring up? Um, I'm pretty darn sure at this point I've committed to talking about board review next week. Um, oh, oh my gosh. I love you, Christine. You're my best friend now. Thank you for showing up. Um, good luck with school. Let me know if you have any questions. What did I, what did I, oh, as a nurse, um, pretty much everything. Cause I'm a job hopper. So I, my, um, uh, first job ever was in the ER at Grady because I, <laughs> I had trauma life in the ER was the popular show on TLC. And I was like, Oh my God, I want to do that. I want to be a trauma nurse. So I kind of pulled some strings. My mom was a nurse and she helped me get a job in the ER. Great. So I went straight there. And, um, I still say to this day, the best stories of my entire career are from those two years at Grady. Um, I cannot tell you the entertainment value. Oh, for MSN. Where did I, where did I go to MP school? Oh, gotcha. MP school. I went to Emory. So I did uh, my acute care. So AGA CNP at Emory. And I had a great experience there. I loved it. Um, very, very expensive kind of Ivy League school, but it was kind of what I needed for me. I wanted something super fast and they were only 18 months. And um, I, I wanted fast. They had a palliative care fellowship because I thought I wanted to do palliative care. And they found clinicals for you. And one of my biggest fears was not being able to find clinicals because that's a whole, I mean, I'm sure as you know, that's a whole ball of wax in your master's program is trying to find clinicals. And a lot of people get delayed from graduation 
for doing that. Um, <laughs> I know it's, it's a nightmare. It's an absolute nightmare. And I, I feel so bad for NP students right now who are really, really struggling with finding placement, particularly FNP, right? Your OB rotation, your P's rotation, there ain't a lot of people who are doing that. So, uh, super stressful. Um, you might want to look into, I don't know how much you're paying for school or what your budget is, but you might want to look into paid preceptorships because if your school doesn't help you much or you don't have options for it, the um, what you would offset in paying for a preceptor might just save you graduating, you know, a whole semester early. Because I've heard so many horror stories about people delaying graduation because they can't get in those two specific rotations. So um, maybe consider that. It's a little on the pricey side, but you would have guaranteed rotations. Um, RL says, hello, hello. Do you know anything about medical massage therapists? Um, I sure wish I did, um, but I don't. Um, I guess I'm assuming this is a subspecialty of massage therapy. It sounds phenomenal. Um, is this like sort of like Reiki, like laying hands on to heal, like healing massage? I'm, I'm down with that, but I don't know anything about it. Um, I wish I did. I'm sorry. Um, it sounds great. It sounds like a great thing. I would pay for it. <laughs> um, Yes. Healing massage. Oh, no, I don't know anything about it. I'd like to learn about it though. I mean, I don't want to do it, but I would definitely be a patient of yours. <laughs> um, nurse Scott says he looked into paid preceptors. The rates vary for now. I don't need it. I can get, it. yes, yes. Um, I've been precepting for four years and I've taken two students through NP hub and I get paid a, I mean, a very, very nominal fee, but it's something um, but when I realized how much they're being charged, it is highway robbery and just more abuse of the system to me. It's, I don't know. I don't really know what the solution is. There's just not enough providers to teach the incoming NPs. And it's very sad. You can practice on me. Absolutely. <laughs> Come on here, RL. Teach us all about it. <laughs> we will learn and we will be your guinea pigs and help you learn, you know, the anatomy here for it. Um, okay. Um, all right. So I'm two minutes over, so I think I'm going to wrap it up, but I can't thank you all enough for joining. You have been so entertaining for me and I appreciate y'all <laughs> coming in and making it fun for me and keeping me straight. I mean, Scott, the nurses at my hospital will thank you. They really will. I thought being in a big metropolitan area, I would have more options, but the big local schools have a monopoly on all the providers. Oh, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, they probably do. You have to network, network and get yourself a calling card. I made a video on calling cards. Um, what's the title of that video? I think it's how to find. Okay. I think it's how to find a job, things you can do to find a job as an NP. And in there, I mean, it's talking about how to, um, you know, how to network in finding a job, but it also works for preceptorships. Um, so we can kind of cobble squat on that side sidebar too. But I, I think there's a definite strategy you can use for cold calling and networking to find people. So, um, but at least you got somebody for the semester. So you, you can, take a little load off for this semester, but I hope you have a great time and um, have a really good rotation. I had the cards, resumes, LinkedIn. Of course you did. Of course you did. Okay, cool. All right. Okay. Well, I will touch base with y'all next week. We'll be talking about board review and um, let me know if you have any questions. All right. Thanks. Happy Thursday, everybody.